fall of 1868, the federal government, through the United States Army, was determined to punish Southern Plains tribes, especially the Cheyennes, for depredations in Kansas during the summer months. Military success in the usually quiet winter months would demonstrate to the tribes that there was no haven in any season. By early November, the military completed preparations for the winter campaign of 1868 and 1869 and columns of troops and supplies, including the 7th United States Cavalry under Lt. Col. George A. Custer, set out from Fort Dodge, Kansas, south into the Indian Territory. In early November, Custer's 7th Cavalry was ready to march south against the hostile Indians. The 19th Kansas Volunteer Cavalry, not being fully mobilized, was ordered to join Custer later at the junction of Wolf Creek and Beaver Creek in the northern part of Indian Territory. This was where General Sully's recent expedition had turned back from pursuing the Cheyenne. General Sheridan ordered Sully to build a supply base at that point, from which mobile columns could be sent in search of hostiles. Wild West Podcast proudly presents Trails to the Washita, Part 4, The Trail to Fort Supply. The Fort Dodge Column got underway on November 12, 1868, to set up a new supply camp in Indian Territory. Sully's command for the expedition consisted of Custer's 7th U.S. Cavalry and Captain John Page's five companies of the 3rd U.S. Infantry. The expedition consisted of a large wagon train and an accompanying herd of cattle. Following Custer down the road were supplies for the Sheridan Winter Campaign, including 4,000 rations to be transported 90 miles beyond Fort Dodge to Camp Supply in Indian Territory. Marching due south, the command moved in four closely formed parallel columns. The usual order of march, as documented by Colonel George A. Custer of the 7th Cavalry, directed. The 400 wagons of the supply train and those belonging to the troops formed in equal columns. In advance of the wagons, at a proper distance, rode the advance guard of cavalry. A corresponding cavalry force formed the rear guard. The remainder of the cavalry was divided into two equal parts, and these parts again divided into three equal detachments. These six detachments were disposed of along the flanks of the column, three on a side, maintaining a distance between themselves and the train from a quarter to a half a mile, while each of them had flanking parties thrown out opposite the train. The force maintained steady marches. It covered 20 miles on November 13th and 18 miles the next day, crossing Cavalry Creek and camping on Bear Creek. Reveille sounded in darkness the next morning. Breakfast followed quickly, and the force was underway as the eastern sky turned to rose. The camp was made early in the afternoon to permit several hours for grazing the horses before dark when they were brought close to the tent lines and tethered to picket ropes pinned to the ground. On November 15th, snow and chilling winds slowed the column, which advanced 11 miles to the Cimarron River. Considerable effort was required to get the heavily loaded wagons over the creeks, streams, and rivers, while snow, ice, and high winds presented further complications with each crossing. On November 15, 1868, Captain Barnett writes the following statements from the camp on the Cimarron in his journal. We marched ten and a half miles today in a direction about due south, perhaps one to two degrees east of south, crossed the Cimarron, where there was some quicksand, and went into camp on the right bank. Sand hills south of the stream. Water is here quite salty. I had a conflict with McGinnis, resulting in his being squelched and tied up and sent to the guardhouse. He was mutinous and mean as usual. As we approached the Cimarron, some small herds of buffalo were seen in the distance. General Custer and the guide set off in pursuit. On going into camp, General Custer came in with 12 quarters strapped upon the horses. The general gave me a very fine hindquarter of a young cow. General Sheridan also departed from Fort Hayes for Fort Dodge on November 15th. Caught in a blizzard the first night out, 
The general took refuge under a wagon, and there spent a miserable night. Continuing down the road the following day, Sheridan reached Fort Dodge that evening in spite of persistent sleet and snow. While at Fort Dodge on November 17th, Sheridan learned two companies of the Kansas Volunteers were just ahead of his party, and the next day they were added to the escort. The plan called for the 19th Kansas Volunteer Cavalry to link up with Sully's force on the Beaver River. Sully's column on November 17th, with a sudden snowstorm whirling down from the north, crossed the track of an Indian war party that had recently passed on its way north. Sully refused Custer permission to follow the track south to the village from which it had come. It was this band of dog soldiers, who after being supplied with food and ammunition by William Dutch Bill Griffinstein, the Indians left to raid the settlements along the Arkansas. They killed Sheridan's couriers between Fort Dodge and Fort Larned, and ran off the mules belonging to a wagon train. Then they rode near Fort Dodge, killing and scalping two civilians. One of these was a hunter named Ralph Morrison, whose body was photographed shortly afterward by William Sewell, the only photograph Sewell made of an atrocity, although he had many opportunities. The following narrative continues the reminiscences of General Godfrey, published in the July 1927 journal. The next morning, we had one of those tedious jobs of crossing a prairie creek. Steep, deep banks, doubling of teams, breaking of coupling poles, amid the shouting and cursing of wagon masters and teamsters. The wagon train was assembled in columns of fours. Two troops of cavalry as the advance guard, three troops with flankers on each flank, and two as rear guard. The infantry companies were distributed along the train, and the beef herd along the train inside the flanking troops. The leading troop on the flanks would march to the head of the train, halt and graze until the rear of the train had passed it, thus alternating so as to save dismounting and yet cover the flanks of the train. The advance guard of one day would be the rear guard of the next day. The details were by roster, so as to equalize the functions. The slow travel of the bull train was a handicap to travel and to arrive in camp on a full day's march. The ensemble made an imposing cavalcade. The march was without special incident till the last day's march down Beaver Creek, when our Osage Indian trailers discovered the trail of a war party of a hundred or more on their way north to raid the frontier. On arrival in camp, General Custer requested permission to take the cavalry on the back trail of this war party and attack the village once they came. General Sully disapproved the proposal on the ground that since it was absurd to suppose the hostiles were unaware of our presence in the country, the village could not be surprised, but would be on alert. He was obsessed with the idea that all our operations were under the constant surveillance of hostile scouts, who kept the tribes fully informed. We arrived at the fork of Beaver and Wolf Creeks on the sixth day of our march. At once, preparations began for the building of the catonment on which was bestowed the name Camp Supply. The isolated post became the abode of many winners of the West. At this place, General Sully had abandoned the pursuit of the hostiles about two months before. In his instructions from the commanding general, General Sully had been ordered to proceed south to the Canadian River and to select a suitable point, which should possess the requisite natural advantages of a depot of supply, with sufficient wood, water, and winter pasture for a large command, the distance south of the Arkansas not to exceed 100 miles. As a guide, the services of an old plainsman of 30 years' experience had been secured, familiarly known as Uncle John Smith. Smith had passed much of his life among the Indians then on the warpath, and had the additional recommendation of a Cheyenne squaw as the partner of his isolation from civilization and the world. John Simpson Smith was born in Kentucky. After serving an apprenticeship to a tailor in St. Louis, he came into the West and lived and traded with the Blackfeet, the Sioux, and finally the Cheyenne. He became a chief trader for William Bent, went with trade goods, and lived among the Cheyenne. His marriage to a Cheyenne woman gave him a unique advantage in trade. Would-be traders from New Mexico had to pay him tribute before they were permitted to barter in the Cheyenne village. In 1846, 
Smith was employed by Thomas Fitzpatrick, the first Indian agent of the Indians of the Upper Arkansas and Platte, as an interpreter with the Cheyenne. He served in that capacity at the significant Fort Laramie Treaty of 1851. As a master of the Cheyenne and Arapaho languages, he furnished Dr. Schoolcraft with a long list of Cheyenne words and their meanings. During the Indian Troubles of 1847, Smith was placed in charge of Fort Mann, six miles west of the site of Fort Dodge, Kansas. The site selected for Camp Supply was suggested by Uncle John, who claimed to have been the first white man to visit the country bordering the two Canadians. Acting upon his suggestion, Sully visited the spot, and after a thorough reconnaissance, found the country to possess all that was claimed for it. On a tongue of land formed by the junction of Beaver and Wolf Creeks, which formed the North Fork of the Canadian, the Army pitched its tents and began preparations to build a fort. They were now in the heart of the chosen hunting grounds of the hostile bands. As it was frequently designated, the Red Man's Paradise was in view of the abundance of game, pasture, wood, and water. They camped over 100 miles south of the Arkansas River and 200 miles from the railroad. The intervening country was a barren waste, traversed by roaming bands of savages, closely watching every movement of the invaders of their lands and ready to pounce upon small parties should they leave camp. On November 18th, a 15-mile stretch brought the full command to Wolf Creek at its confluence with the Beaver. General Field Order No. 8 of Headquarters, District of Upper Arkansas, named the spot Camp Supply. A roundabout storms continued to threaten. The air was crisp but uncertain. Everybody must turn to and help erect storehouses to shelter the supplies. The Kansas volunteers should arrive at any moment, but they did not, for they were lost, snowed in and starving far to the north. The next day, activities began in locating and laying out the catonment, digging trenches for the stockade and for the quarters and barracks to house the personnel, and digging wells for water supply. Outside parties, guarded by mounted troops, were sent to gather supplies and materials for the post. The hum of the mowing machines was accompanied by the ring of the axe, punctuated by the crash of the falling timber. With axes and saws, these trees were made into usable parts, which the bull teams snaked to convenient sites to load in wagons. The mule whackers hauled them to the catonment where they were sorted for various uses, such as palisades, upright walls for buildings, rafters, etc., etc., what a contrast these pioneer activities were to the centuries of quiet and wildlife. Yet to the participants, it was all in a day's work. On November 19, 1868, from the newly established supply camp, Captain Barnett's enters the following statements in his journal. As General Sully announces, a camp of supply for the troops operating south of the Arkansas is to be located here. Until further orders, it is to be designated Camp Supply. A log structure is to be erected here to protect the infantry, about 150 men, who are to remain here, and as a magazine for supplies, while two companies of cavalry, one comprising 11 companies of the 7th Cavalry under General Custer, and the other, comprising ten companies of the 19th Kansas Volunteer Cavalry under Colonel Governor Crawford, are to march southward, with 25 or 30 days' supplies, to punish the Indians. This program is set forth in General Field Orders No. 10 of this date from Headquarters District of the Upper Arkansas. A large number of hospital tents were erected, well begun, and dug 10 or 12 feet to quicksand on site of New Post. Major Inman begins to unload his vast supply of axes, spades, shovels, grindstones, doors and casings, window casings, sashes, boards, and a large pile of pollens being among the latter. The Osages look on in wonder, Lieutenant Jackson smoking ponderous meerschaum and seeming to reflect deeply with great solemnity as he superintends the construction of a sawed chimney for Major Inman's tent. The infantry has cut 600 logs today, and the mowing machines have done well. The prospects are that we'll be obliged to stay here for a couple of weeks before we can go, for the infantry have no idea of being left unprotected before the new post is completed. 
Our Osages have discovered a northward trail recently traversed by a war party of four or five hundred Indians. General Custer has applied for permission to leave two companies of cavalry here to protect the infantry. At the same time, he follows down the Indian trail in search of their villages. His request will scarcely be complied with. The next day after they arrived at the camp, regardless of snow and wet, a train was made up to convey 30 days' supplies for the expedition. The troops and horses, arms and accoutrements were inspected, but few tents were allowed. A pair of blankets strapped to the saddle and the clothes on their backs constituted the quota of baggage alike for officers and men. By the same night, the command was in condition to move. The commanding general determined to have on hand a large number of extra supplies at the storage depot to be constructed in connection with the new fort, and notwithstanding the heavy weather, sent a train over 200 wagons back to Fort Dodge with orders to draw from the large stock accumulated there for the store at the camp of supply. The cavalry worked with infantry in erecting winter quarters as comfortably as circumstances and appliances would permit. Still, for their part, they were content with the ordinary camp discomforts, for being but birds of passage, they knew their stay would be short. Building crews laughingly referred to the name Camp Supply as a misnomer. For a while, there were partial supply of everything, but there was not an adequate supply of anything. When completed, the comfortable quarters were pits, four and a half feet deep, walled with cottonwood logs arising above ground three feet, and covered with logs, straw, and earth. Albert Barnett's wrote the following in his journal on the evening of November 20th, 1868. Hitherto I have refused for several months to sign any whiskey orders, as they are called, permits for the men to purchase whiskey from the camp trader. But having been so frequently importuned of late by both privates and non-commissioned officers of the company for permits, and finding that by some means they obtain whiskey at any rate, probably by inducing acquaintances and other companies to procure permits for themselves from their officers, and get the whiskey and then paying them for it at a great advance on its cost. I have therefore endeavored to reconcile matters in some way, so that the temperate men of the company may not be entirely debarred from the privilege of paying the trader $12 a gallon for an inferior article of whiskey. At the same time, the intemperate men will be restrained from excess. All will feel an interest proportionate to their love of the inebriating drink to preserve a proper state of sobriety in the troop. I have agreed to sign a permit not to exceed one quart per day for each squad, making one gallon for the entire company. The chiefs of squads are to hand in on a slip of paper before the guard mounting the names of all the men of their squads who wish whiskey and the amount required. I then write one order for the entire amount, and after the order or permit has been approved by General Custer, one non-commissioned officer selected by the chiefs of squads goes to the trader with his money contributed pro rata by the men concerned, and procures, in four canteens, the entire amount. This arrangement is intended to prevent the counterfeiting of orders, or permits, as only one will be signed daily, and that never for more than a gallon, and I know just what men obtain the liquor. If any man becomes intoxicated, he will not be permitted to have any more liquor during the present year, and no permit will be signed for the squad to which he belongs for ten days. This arrangement will tend to restrain men from excesses, or if does not accomplish this, the allowance will be diminished or shut off entirely. This evening, Major Elliott and General Custer had all the chestnut-colored horses found in any of the troops led out and allowed me to exchange other horses for them, provided I could match the company's color to which the horse belonged. I got eight of my own color, chestnut. The foundation logs of Fort Beecher laid today went down and sat on a log and talked with General Sully concerning the contemplated structure. He told me of how one of the Osage Indians today had kicked and spit at and cursed in his own tongue a small whirlwind that came by from the north, and which he, the Osage, believed to be the ghost of one of the Arapaho warriors who went northward three or four days ago and who had been killed, the ghost being, as the Osage said, on his way south to the Arapaho village to inform his relatives of the fact of his death. The sun rose upon a clear sky on the morning of the fourth day after their arrival. 
The storm had passed, leaving several feet of snow as evidence of its presence. The first advantage taken of the turn in the weather was to concentrate the camp into a smaller compass. All tents were now pitched in close vicinity to the site of the fort. As expected, they would not move for several weeks. The headquarters tents were heavily banked and thus rendered quite comfortable. Strong wooden frames were also inside to strengthen the frail structures resisting the terrific winter blasts. Over a few days, the little canvas dwellings presented quite an appearance of luxury and taste, considering hundreds of miles intervened between them and civilization. During the recent storm, work had been almost entirely suspended upon the fort. The reappearance of sunlight and the grateful heat imparted by the welcome luminary caused the snow to vanish almost as rapidly as it had fallen. The camp, as a consequence, was once more a scene of industry. The troops were to accomplish the entire work of building the fort. In order to perform the duty without confusion, and at the same time to be prepared for the emergency of an attack, the infantry of the command was divided into reliefs, each having certain duties assigned to them. Under proper officers, many choppers were sent into the woods with no other duty than to fell trees. Mule and ox teams, brought with them for labor, or in the case of emergency as a reserve commissariat, with the requisite number of teamsters and laborers, were detailed from the train to drag in the logs as they were cut. Another party of troops, under the supervision of officers, was stationed at the fort to prepare the logs and move them into position in the structure. A strong guard was stationed in the timber and on the adjacent hills, to signal war parties or repel any attack until the working details could be rallied for defense. The picture presented in this everyday life in the depths of that wild home reminded them more of the first steps to establishing a pioneer settlement than the work of the less peaceful pursuit of war. At sunrise each day, the bugle called for the various details of their labors. The choppers with axes and rifles were marched into the woods under the escort of the guard. The teams followed with drag chains clanking. From morning until night, the strokes of the chopper's axe and the shouts of the teamsters rang through the silent wood, immense fires built for the men's comfort. Occasionally, the sharp crack of the hunter's rifle mingled with the hum of industry. After the hours of toil, the troopers returned to camp at night, generally bringing in good quantities of buffalo meat, elk, deer, antelope, wild turkeys, and rabbits killed by the guard. It was worthy of remark to see the perfect readiness of the troops to engage in pursuits so novel and entirely out of their line of duty. Their interest was certainly heightened at the prospect of more comfortable quarters than the canvas habitations they were then occupying, and a choice supper of the game in the place of salt pork was all the more ravenously devoured by an appetite sharpened by the day's toil. On November 21st, 1868, Albert Barnett wrote the following letter to his wife, Jenny, from Camp Supply, Indian Territory. I wrote you a very hasty letter this afternoon and handed it to Bradley the scout as he sat upon his horse waiting, while a detachment of 150 mounted men was moving out to escort him 40 miles on his way toward Fort Dodge tonight. He had just deposited the letter carefully in the pocket of his hunting shirt when a cloud of dust was discovered some miles away to the westward. At the same time, the picket reported a wagon train approaching, and presently Colonel Moore of General Sheridan's staff arrived and reported the General and General Forsyth, Surgeon Morris J. Ash, Colonel Andrew J. McGonagall, Colonel Crosby, and CNC just behind, escorted by a squadron of the 19th Kansas Volunteer Cavalry judge of our surprise. We'd expected General Sheridan to come down, but not so soon. We expected the Kansas companies from Dodge to come down escorting additional supplies, which they still need to do. Well, of course, the previous letter, it was written in General Silly's tent when I learned that a scout was ready to start, and while he was at the door, readjusting his saddle, did not go out. Shortly after dark this evening, officer's call sounded at General Custer's quarters, and he informed us that he was going down presently to make an informal call upon General Sheridan. He requested all the officers who desired to do so to accompany him, stating that he was going to take the band along and give the general some music. 
Well, we all went up and called upon General Sheridan. He received us in his good, genial way, shaking hands with all and seemed pleased to see us. He received us in the open air, around a big campfire. Like Grant, Sheridan is a man of few words, but he always looks very animated, and although he does not say much, you come away with the impression that you have had quite a prolonged and interesting conversation with him. He is a little disappointed with our failure to meet with Indians. Perhaps he would have preferred that General Sully should have allowed us to proceed at once in search of the Indians upon our arrival here, instead of delaying to aid and protect the infantry while they were constructing sort of a permanent fortification for their security and comfort, quite as much as for the protection of our supplies. Paulins would have sufficed to cover them, and rifle pits or hastily constructed stockades would have answered all purposes for a short campaign very well. If it had become necessary to construct more permanent works here, there would have been ample time hereafter. As it is, the infantry all have an abundance of A tents alone, while the cavalry has only little shelter tents, which they carry on their horses, one wall tent for the officers of each company, and an A tent for each first sergeant. It has commenced snowing since I returned from General Sheridan's camp, which is five or six hundred yards distant. If it continues, I suppose it will greatly facilitate the tracking up of our Indian friends when we start after them. We are ready to move now and only await the arrival of the Kansas Cavalry, under the immediate command of Colonel Crawford, the governor, when we will at once move southward with twenty-five or thirty days of rations and forage. In a letter written to Libby Custer while in camp on Beaver Creek, one hundred miles from Fort Dodge, Custer writes the following on November 21st, 1868. We crossed a fresh trail of a large war party going north the day we reached here. I sent our Indian scouts to follow at a short distance to determine the strength and direction of the party. The guides all report the trail of a war party going northeast, and that they evidently have just come from the village, which must be located within 50 miles of us in a southerly direction. Had the Kansas volunteers been here, as was expected, my orders would then have allowed me to follow the back trail of the war party right to their village. We would have found the latter in an unprotected state, as their warriors had evidently gone north, either to Larned or Zara, or to fight the Osage or Kaw Indians, who are now putting up their winter meat. We did not encounter an Indian coming to this last point, which proves that our campaign was not expected by them. Tonight, six scouts start for Dodge with our mail and dispatch for headquarters. That's it for now. Remember to check out our Wild West Podcast shows on iTunes or wildwestpodcast.buzzsprout.com. You can also catch us on Facebook at facebook.com slash wildwestpodcast or on our YouTube channel at Wild West Podcast, Mike King, YouTube. So make sure you subscribe to our shows listed at the end of the description text of this podcast to receive notification on all new episodes. Thanks for listening to our podcast. If you have any comments or would like to add to our series, please write us at wildwestpodcast at gmail.com. We will share your thoughts as they apply to future episodes. Stay tuned next time as we bring you historic buildings, landmarks of Dodge City, and the book's author, Tim Wenzel. From all of us here at Wild West Podcast, have a happy Independence Day. <laughs>